the speaker, and he's got a lot to say. And I would like to again apologize to the church for something that uh, I have done. I know it's odd for me to apologize, but someone came to me not long ago and they asked me some questions about, did I know the difference between the NIV Bible and the King James Version? I said, yes. And they asked me a second question, and I said, yes. And when we got about to the third one, they said, why haven't you told us? Well, I only preach from a King James Version Bible. It's all I've ever known. It's all I ever intend to use. And it kind of goes like this. You know, we're on a journey toward heaven. And you know we got to get it right. This while while we've got time here, we've got to get it right. We know what our destination is, but we don't know all the pathway. Sometimes we get off track, so we got to get it right. I I use the uh, phrase one time that if you were heading to Washington and you thought you was on the right path and you had a map that looked pretty good, and you woke up one morning and you're in Seattle, Washington but you intended to go to Washington, D.C., you had made a horrible mistake and too late to turn back. So with that said, several have asked me, why don't you preach on this more? And I said, well, I use the King James Version Bible. I just thought everybody did. But since we don't, and we don't know why, and just following me is a poor excuse. You need to know why, amen? So I call upon the one man that I feel like knows more about the differences in the Bible. He just got a hold of this several, several years ago. And just like a hungry dog after a piece of meat, he couldn't let it go. And I feel like my Brother Michael Hoggart knows more on this subject than anybody. I called him, asked him if he'd come down and preach for us one Sunday night. He said he'd be glad to. Brother Michael Hoggart, come to the stage, please. Anyway, thank you for having me down, Brother Ron. I've known Ron for many years. He gave me my first job after my wife and I got married, and he didn't know what he was getting himself into with me. And uh, But he taught me to... I, I had trained for the ministry, and I'd been to Bible college, but and I thought that right after I got married, I would be ready to go preach, and God said, Mike, you don't even know how to lead a home. You can't pastor a church. So God used this man to take a young boy and help him turn into a man to know a, a man's work and to work a man's job and to, to work for the wage that he gave me. And I appreciate him. And, and uh, he and I, have, we haven't always seen eye to eye over the years. That I, he's been mad at me and I've been mad at him. And he got over it and I got over it. And if you get mad at me tonight, you'll get over it in about 20 years. All right. So... Um, let me tell you my testimony, and I've got so many things running through my mind. You see the verses up on the screen. Most of what I'm going to give you tonight, I'm going to have up on the screen. And if you can't read it, then open your Bible up and try to follow along with me. And if you can't keep up, then what I'm going to tell you is I have most everything that I'm going to say tonight is on DVDs. Now, if I could get one of you guys to hand out one copy of I think there's four different DVDs in that box up there if I could have somebody do that now we uh, distribute about 5,000 DVDs a month we never sell them and there's one good reason for that nobody will buy them so we just throw them at people and say watch it we have an internet ministry in fact Ron called me when you guys were ready to start streaming and me and my son-in-law came down and set all that up for you guys and um, since I've counted, since about 2011, uh, the sermons that I have put on the Internet, the Internet is a great thing and it's a terrible thing because the devil has used the Internet to seed false doctrine and false ideas everywhere. There were ideas that were dying out before the Internet and now they have gained ground over the years. And I see the ministry that God has given me if all the people who are going to lie about God are standing over here telling their lies. I want to be on the other side of the street at least telling the truth and give people a choice whether they're going to believe the truth or not. And so 
Most everything I'm going to say tonight is on those DVDs. What's not on those DVDs, I'm recording this tonight. Of course, it's streaming, and I appreciate them streaming this. You'll be able to watch it later. And then I'll have the finished DVD that I will send down multiple copies to this church. And if anybody ever asks about this subject again, then you guys are equipped. I want you to take your Bible, turn to uh, Matthew chapter 13, if you would. I don't have that up on the screen. I'm not sure if I have it in my notes or not, but we'll get there in a little bit. And while you're turning there, let me tell you my testimony. I grew up, for the most part, in church. I attend Bethel Church up in Festus. That's where I was saved. And uh, I surrendered to the call to ministry when I was 16 at that church. Brother Ken Golf was the pastor then. He's now gone on to be with the Lord. God gave me some godly pastors to train me and to teach me as a young man. And as a young teenager, I was convinced that this authorized 1611 Bible was right. And the newer versions that were starting to come out had errors in it. I had read some literature on it, and I was convinced of it. Then I went to Bible college. I went to two different denominational Bible colleges. Fairly conservative, but both of them taught me that there were errors and mistakes in every translation of the Bible that I couldn't trust and you couldn't trust what you read in your Bible. And I had to be some Greek and Hebrew expert to tell you how the Bible really should be translated. And I believed it. I bought into that, and I went completely to the other side on this issue. And I was willing to follow what all the other preachers were doing. They were going over to the NIV. They were using the New American Standard Bible. They were using these different Bibles, and I was on my way to do that. When I pastored the Richwoods Free Will Baptist Church, I pastored there. That was my first church for three years. I would preach out of a King James but I bought a big box of NIVs for all the people that got saved. And I've repented of that ever since. Because I believed what I was told in Bible college, that all the Bibles have mistakes in them. You can't trust any of them. You must read the Hebrew and Greek to know what God really said. Now I'm going to show you from the Bible why that is wrong. I'm not going to give you a Greek lecture. I'm not going to talk about so much about the manuscripts, although I'm going to talk about that a little bit. But I'm going to give you what the Bible says about the Bible. Where do we get our doctrine about who Jesus is? Where do we get that doctrine from? Do we get it from man? We get it from the Bible, don't we? What do we believe about the blood, the blood atonement? Do we get that from theologians? Do we get that from the Pope? Or do we get that from the Word of God? What do we believe about the cross? What do we believe about substitutionary atonement? What do we believe about grace versus works? What do we believe about keeping the law versus you can't keep the law? What do we believe about heaven? What do we believe about hell? All of those important doctrines came to us by way of God's written record, the Word of God. So my question is, why is it what we believe about the Bible why doesn't that come from the Bible instead of the theologians and the seminaries and the Bible colleges? Because like I said, I went to two conservative colleges. Free Will Baptist Bible College was one of them in Nashville, Tennessee. And they both told me that there was errors and mistakes in every Bible, and I believed it. Then I took the church there at Bethel. I've been there for 25 some odd years, been the pastor there. And it was a horrible time for me. God was going to deal with me, and he was going to deal with me as a son. And he straightened me out. God had to chasten me often over the errors that I had gotten into, the sins that I had gotten into. And God took a young man, and he loved me enough to save me out of the mess that I had gotten myself in. One day, I was just thinking about God's Word and thinking about things that God was teaching me out of His Word. And I felt the Holy Ghost say, Mike... You know that Bible's right. You know there's not a mistake in it. Now, it's sort of like when you get saved. When God calls you to get saved, you don't fight God. You just surrender and say, just as I am, without one plea. And that is exactly what I did in my office that day in 1998. I'll never forget it. I surrendered to it with no evidence whatsoever. All I had was faith. But isn't faith the substance of things hoped for? And... The evidence of things not seen. So that's right. The Bible says that. So that is exactly what I surrendered to with no evidence whatsoever. 
But then I wasn't satisfied with that, and the devil was going to challenge it for sure. And so I said, God, show me the evidence. Show me that I'm right. Because here's the argument that I used when I was on the other side of this. We don't have the original paper that John wrote his gospel on, that Isaiah wrote his prophecies on, that Moses wrote the law on. We don't have any of those originals. So I had a guy in my church that would argue with me about this subject. He was King James. And I said, look, I know both sides of the argument. If you show me the original manuscripts, that way we can compare which Bible is right, then I'll believe it. And I knew that he couldn't do it because those manuscripts don't exist anywhere. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? That every original manuscript, papyrus or vellum, now I'll explain that in a minute, every original document that the apostles wrote on disappeared, gone, as if into thin air. They're not anywhere on the earth that we know of. All we have is copies. And you have to ask the question, did God preserve his word past the original manuscripts? That was a hang-up for me, and I wouldn't believe it until God came into me that day. So then God began to supply the evidence. Now, I have you there in Matthew 13. Matthew 13 is an interesting chapter of the Bible because it deals with seed. Almost all the parables in Matthew 13 deal with seed. You have the parable of the wheat and the tares. You have the parable of the seed and the sower. And I want to show you something from this. I want you to look, Matthew chapter 13. Oh, let's look at uh, verse 18. Here, therefore, the parable of the sower. He's going to talk about the seed and the sower. What is the seed? It's the word of God. Look at what it says. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, Mark's gospel says the word of God, and understandeth it not, then cometh who? The wicked one. Who's the wicked one? Satan, what does he do when someone hears the word of God? He immediately comes and takes away the word that was sown into somebody's heart. You give a gospel tract to somebody, you give a DVD or a, a sermon CD from your pastor to somebody, you try to evangelize them in any way, and most people in this world will walk away from it and they'll split hell wide open, won't they? You know why? Because the devil's standing there waiting for you to show up. He's going to destroy the word of God before before it ever takes effect in that person's life. Am I telling you the truth? The, notice the second thing that happens. Look at verse 20. But he that received the seed, which is the Bible, the Word of God, and, and not the original manuscripts. We cannot sow the original manuscripts because we don't have them. All we can sow to people is... For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, how many of you understood every word I just said? And I didn't have to use Greek to do it. Amen? Amen? So, but he that received the seed into stony places is the same that heareth the word. He heard the word. He immediately received it with joy, but he has no root. Stony ground people are people who come in our churches, they pretend to get saved, and they last for a little while, but then they have a hardness in their heart. I knew a man all my life, I knew this man. He was a high school science teacher. We tried for years to get this man to come to the altar, and he never would. We visited him, gave him tracts, tried to get him in church, never would come. Finally, after he retired, his wife got him to go. That she, They moved down to a different place. They started going to church. He went down to the altar one night. Everybody said, well, he's finally got it. A year later, that same pastor preached Genesis 1 and preached that God created the universe in six literal days, 6,000 years ago. That man got up out of that service, told that pastor he was an idiot, and said, I can't believe you believe something that foolish and walked out never to come back again. What happened to the word of God that was sown in his life? It hit the stony ground of his mind and his heart, and it was destroyed right then and there. The man never believed it after that. Look at, look at the third group. Verse 22, he also that received seed among the thorns. You know what thorns represent in the Bible? Look at this. And he, is he that heareth the word and cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, Mark says, and the lust of other things, those are your thorns. And you still have them, by the way. Do, are there not things in this world that we like? Do we not still have lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life? Do you not ever grow a garden and hate to see them old prickly things come up in it? You know they'll do what to your garden? Choke it out. Look at your Bible. Choke the word and becometh unfruitful. There's four groups in this parable 
all four of them receive the word of God in various ways, and only one of them goes to heaven, the good ground, because they heard the word and they believed it. And they didn't let the devil take it away from them. Now look at the next parable. Verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. What's that good seed? What did we say it was? The word of God. But while men slept, his enemy came and did what? Sowed tares. Does anybody here know what tares are? I actually have this in my notes, and I'm going to show it to you in a little bit. I'm going to show you why Jesus used this particular illustration. But here we have two parables in the Bible. Already, we find out that the devil's number one biggest enemy and his biggest target, the thing that he tries to destroy every single time, is the words that God said to mankind. Our Savior told us that. And I heard a man... He's supposed to be a scholar and a Greek expert and somebody who knows more than anything else. His name is James White. I'll talk about him in a little bit. But he wrote a book called The King James Only Controversy. And what he said was, there is no evidence anywhere in the Bible that the devil destroys God's word. And I went, what a liar. Isn't that what you call people? Let me ask you this. Who in this world is a liar? Everybody. Who is the only one that will always tell you the truth and can never lie to you? Let God be true and every man a liar. Which means I'm not even asking you to believe me and what I say. I'm asking you to believe what this book says. Notice this, 2 Corinthians 2.17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Already in the Apostle Paul's day, somewhere around 80, 40, 50, 60, 70, somewhere around in there, just 30, 40 years after Christ has left, already the Gospels are being written, the, uh, the Apostles' letters are being written, Paul's writing the doctrines, showing everybody the mysteries of the Gospel and so on, revealing that to mankind for the first time ever. And already the devil, he's aware that the devil has moved in and started using evil men to destroy and corrupt the very words that God gave to those men. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn there in your Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Underline these. Know your enemy. Know your enemy. The Bible says that we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. How does he work in my life? How does he try to get to me? How does he work in your life? How does he try to destroy you? How does he try to destroy your family? How does he go after your grandchildren? Same way. Same way as he did at the very beginning. Notice what Paul said. But I fear, lest by any means, including the pulpits, the seminaries, the Bible colleges, the Sunday school literature, the vacation Bible school literature, he said, I fear lest by any means. He said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he said, he also said the very same thing. Let no man deceive you by any means. As the serpent beguiled Eve. One of the most important words that I found in my King James Bible is the word as. Because you know what God's doing? He's showing you that this compares to this. How will we know the time of his second coming? Jesus told us as it was when. In the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So all we have to do is study our Bibles, learn the days of Noah, and we'll know what it's going to look like when he's returning. So he gave us this example. As the serpent beguiled Eve, through his subtlety, the devil will never walk into a church or send a man into a church and say, Hi, I believe in the Antichrist, and I'm here to lead everybody to hell. Never happens. But I did read... Years ago, I got onto a Free Will Baptist Minister's um, chat board. This was before Facebook. That's where all these preachers get, and they discuss how they pastor their churches. And I was amazed, Brother Doyle, at there was a group called How to Switch Your Church from the King James Bible to a Modern Bible. So I decided to look into that. And I saw a name of a pastor that I knew. From Oklahoma. He said, here's how I did it. 
I got me one of them churches, and they all old people had that King James, and I knew I didn't wasn't going to preach out of that. But he wasn't going to tell that church that when they hired him on. He wasn't going to stand up in front of that church and say, Now, I believe the NIV is the word of God. If you don't like that, you can leave. He never did that. He said, What I did was I preached for a while, didn't say anything, used the King James. And then he said, Well, I like a better translation on this particular verse here. And he'd give them an alternate translation. Then after a while, he would just say, now the NIV, or the New American Standard, actually renders this verse better, in my opinion, by saying this. And before long, he has sown the seeds of discord in that church, where everybody had the same Bible. Now he has sown discord in amongst that congregation. And what does God hate? He that soweth discord among brethren. I knew that pastor, and I knew he wasn't right doing that. He was subtle in his disguise. By saying, I'm going to give you the word of God, but I'm going to give you a different word of God. Through a subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth, number one, another Jesus, not another Buddha, not another Mohammed, another Jesus, whom you have not preached, or you receive another spirit, are there different spirits? There's unclean spirits, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, which you have not received, or another gospel. Remember what we said a while ago about where our doctrine comes from. Where does our gospel come from? The Bible. You lead somebody to Jesus, Ron, you say Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10.9 and 10, Ephesians 2.8 and 9, 1 John 1.9, 9, 3, John 3.16, Psalm 32, and anything else that the Holy Ghost lays on your heart, you give them scriptures. And if they're going to believe that, they can be saved. Amen. So he said, study how Satan beguiled Eve. How did he do it? Go back to Genesis 3. The very first thing the devil did when he made his entrance into planet Earth was attempt to destroy God's commandments, God's word in Eve and then Adam. And Paul makes it a point to say the devil didn't go to Adam first, the stronger vessel. He went to Eve, the weaker vessel. And by the way, who did God give his commandment to, Adam or Eve? Adam. When he gave the commandment to Adam, Eve had not been created yet. And he told Adam, see that tree? You shall not eat of it, lest ye die. And Adam believed him. So the devil didn't go to Adam directly. He went to Eve. And this is what he did. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, number one, yea, hath God said, question mark. The first thing he'll do is what he did with me. Question the authority and authenticity of the word of God. You see, if you believe that every one of these words came down from heaven to man and they're still right and righteous, you can be saved. You got the right doctrine. Amen? So the devil will say, now, Mike, you know that there's no way the earth could have held that much water to have the whole earth flooded. So maybe that story is not quite right. Or what about all these people now who say that they're sodomites and God made them that way? Well, surely God loves them like he does everybody else. Maybe that's not right, too. Maybe they didn't translate that right in the Bible either. And he'll start throwing all these fiery darts at you to try to get you to doubt and question the authority and the authenticity of what God said. Maybe we don't have every word of God. Maybe God didn't preserve it. Second thing he did... The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. The serpent said unto the woman, Number two, you shall not surely die. Now that is a direct contradiction to God's word. God actually said, Ye shall surely die. He said, Ye shall not surely die. Number one, question the authority of God's word. Number two, correct God's word. Number three, then he said this, verse five, for God doth know 
that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Now, did God say that to Adam at any time? No. So here's what he did. He offered Eve a replacement for God's word. If I were to stop preaching right now, which I won't, and say to you, what has the devil replaced in your life where God's word used to be? What would your answer be? TV, internet, family time, hunting, fishing, shopping. What has the devil used in your life to replace the authority and authenticity of God's word? And notice in all that he said, he never one time said, eat of that fruit, did he? He never said that. All he had to do was remove Eve away from the power of God's word to where she didn't believe it anymore. And she went and sinned all by herself. She's the one that looked upon the fruit and said, it is pleasant to the eyes. It is good to eat. It will make me wise. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, all wrapped up in that one fruit. She partook of it. So did I. So I've stopped finding all this out and I'm getting angry at the devil for taking me on a course in my life that could have killed me had God not stepped in in a young preacher's life, saved my ministry, saved my life, literally with this book. So, number one, question authenticity of God's word. Yeah, God said. Number two, contradict God's word. You shall not surely die. Replace God's word, for God doth know. Now, we've already looked at Matthew chapter 13. Now, look up on the screen. I have a picture of wheat, and I have a picture of tares. Which is which? I'll give you a free DVD if you get it right. I already got you a free DVD. What'd you say, ma'am? You are the smartest lady in this whole church. I can tell you that right now. Uh-oh. Who is it? You're right. Now, if you were going to eat from one of these... And you had to pick now. Would you bet your life on it? No. See, that's what the devil did, didn't he? He replaced God's word with something that was similar to God's word. Paul said another Jesus, another spirit, similar to the Holy Spirit. They call him the Holy Spirit. It's not the Holy Spirit. Uh, another gospel. It looks like it's from heaven, but it's not from heaven. It's from hell. So, which one is wheat? And I guarantee you there's a difference here. Which one is wheat? Which one is here? Now, I said this at a gathering one time, and, and this old boy happened to know wheat, and he picked the right one because he knew what they looked like. But here's the thing about tares. They're actually called poison darnel. You ever heard of darnel? Okay. Poison darnel. The reason why they call it that is that this particular plant it has um, a symbiotic relationship with a fungus. This fungus that's in this world only grows on poison darnel. It never grows on wheat, never grows on corn, doesn't grow on anything else. It grows on poison darnel. And this fungus here, when ingested, number one, it gives you a feeling of drunkenness. Think about that. And then it kills you. So it puts your mind to sleep first which is exactly what the devil wants. Remember what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5? We are children of the day and not of night. We are awake. We're not asleep as others are who drink and are in the darkness. We're not like them. We're awake. So that's what poison Darnell does. So now it makes sense. When they went to the master and they said, Master, some, an enemy has sown tares in among our wheat. Should we go gather it up? And he said, No, lest you gather up the wheat also. Let them both grow until when? Harvest. Have you ever noticed that when you harvest something, it always changes, doesn't it? Tomatoes, green to red. Apples, green to red. Watermelon, you always thump them, right? To know when. Wheat is the same way. Wheat goes from green to what color? 
golden like the sun. And there's a reason for that. I may not, may not get into it tonight. You know what color poison Darnell turns when it ripens? Black. You think about the difference between golden sunlight and black. You see how wise our master is, our savior? He said, we're not going to gather him that now. We're going to gather him up on a day you can tell the difference. Amen? So if I put the cover of a book up here, both of them say Holy Bible. One of them is, and one of them isn't. Now I'm going to use an illustration. Um, take your Bible, turn to Daniel chapter 3. I did this in Kenya. We have a ministry in Kenya because my son-in-law's from there and um, it's growing and thriving and we got the privilege to go preach to the people in Kenya who, by the way, they read and speak very good English just like we do because at one time they were a British colony. And I had checked the Swahili. Most Kenyans know three languages. They know their tribal language, they know English, and they know Swahili. Swahili is a common language amongst them, so is English. A lot of the signs, billboards, road signs are in English and Swahili, so it's a language they all know. So I checked the Swahili translation of the Bible for certain things. I know what to look for now. And I asked them, I was preaching to Kenyans, and I said, I learned some Swahili last night. Boy, they were excited. I said, Mwanawa Mungu. And they went, yeah, yeah. I said, did I say it right? Mwanawa Mungu. They said, yeah. They don't like my accent. But they said, yeah, you said it right. I said, what does that mean? They said, the son of God. Moana is son. Mungu is God. I said, great. What? Jesus is the Moana wa Mungu. And they said, amen. And they danced a little bit. And then I said, ah, yeah, Jesus is Moana wa Miungu. And they went, no, 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 no. I said, what did I say? And I knew what I was doing. They said, Miungu has a Y in it, which pluralizes it. You said a son of the gods. And I said, who was in the fiery furnace? They said, Wanawamungu, the son of God. I said, open your Swahili Bible to Daniel 3.25. Open your Bible to Daniel 3.25. Who did Nebuchadnezzar say was in the fiery furnace? The son of God. Do you know what their Swahili Bible said? Wanawamungu, a son of the gods. You know, they got angry. Some of them wept. And the pastor stood up and he said, I've heard enough. And I went, oh, man, I'm done. I'm toasted meat here. And he said, I realize I've been preaching out of a book for 20 years, but I've not been preaching out of the word of God. He knew that they had corrupted his Bible. And it made him angry, just like it made me. If your Bible says that he's the son of God, you have the right Bible. You know what the NIV says? A son of the gods. You know what the New American Standard says? A son of the gods. You know what the Holman Christian Standard says? A son of the gods. Matthew chapter 7. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So can a bad Bible bring forth salvation? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We are born again by a book that not only is not corrupted, the word incorruptible means it cannot be corrupted. Somebody say amen. Now, I'm going to move kind of fast, and I'm going to speed up a little bit for you. I'm going to move through some verses. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you. Answer the question, is there a difference between the King James and, let's say, the NIV, the New American Standard, the New English Version, the Holman, Holman Publishing is the publishing arm of the Southern Baptist Convention. When Holman got tired of paying the royalties to Zondervan for use of the NIV in their literature, they said, well, let's make up our own copyrighted Bible. That way we don't have to pay anybody for it. And so they did. So the Holman Christian Standard Bible and all the modern Bibles, or 
as the preachers will tell you and some people online will tell you, well, there's no difference in the Bibles. They just updated the language so we could all understand it. But is that true? So let me show you the difference. The corruption will come in three forms. They will either change how the verse is read, what it says, or number two, they will omit part of a verse, or number three, they will completely omit an entire verse. First of all, Hosea chapter 11, verse 12, Ephraim compasseth me about with lies, the house of Israel with deceit, but Judah yet ruleth with God. What does Judah do? Rules with God. But the NIV says Judah is unruly against God. Now, how can both of those verses be simultaneously true? They can't be. So one guy says, well, I like to get multiple translations out and read all of them so I can kind of see what God is saying. But if God says in one that Judah ruleth with God and another Judah is unruly against God, it can God lie? No. Genesis 22. In the King James, God told Abraham to offer his son for a burnt offering. You know what an offer is, don't you? Somebody offers you something, money, a house, a deal on a car. They make an offer to you. You can walk away from it or you can accept it. But that's not what the NIV and the modern translation say. They say that God told him to sacrifice him there. But that's not what God told him to do. Because if that's the case, when Abraham lays Isaac on the altar and he gets ready to plunge the knife into him, an angel said, stay your hand. Don't, don't do that. He has to look at that angel and say, I don't know who you are, but my God told me to kill him and that's what I'm going to do. God doesn't change his word, and he didn't change it here. Once Abraham had laid him on that altar, he had fulfilled exactly what God told him to do. So is there a difference? Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive. Who? The Revised Standard Version. Uh-oh, I've done something. Here we go. A young woman will conceive but not a virgin. Is there a difference? Yes. Micah chapter 5. This is a prophecy concerning where Jesus was born. Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be a little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Did Jesus have a beginning? Was he not always before the world? He said, before Abraham was, I am. John 17, Father, share with me the glory that we had before the world was. So we know he was there from the beginning. But the NIV and every other modern translation says, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Are they the same? Matthew 18, 3, and said, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God or enter the kingdom of God. Be converted implies that an outside source changed you. The new translations, remember, they'll change the gospel. I tell you the truth unless you change. But have you tried that? Have you tried to change? Did it work? God had to do it. Amen? See, it's a different gospel already. It's a different gospel. For God so loved... Oh, surely they didn't mess with this one. For God so loved the world, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The key is his only begotten. Are we not sons of God? Sure we are. But the modern translation, New English Version, his only son. RSV, his only son. NIV, his one and only son. But that's not true, is it? Is there a difference? Daniel 3.25, the NIV, English Standard Version, Christian Standard Bible, New American Standard Bible, every modern translation calls him a son of the gods. And the Swahili Bible. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Do you believe that? Okay, and I'm going to show you how that works. But 
The NEV, New English Version, says every inspired scripture has its use. In other words, they're not all inspired. 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Do you believe that? The modern translations say he appeared in a body. Who did? It does not define the doctrine that God became flesh. And what is the doctrine of the Antichrist? He will deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. That's what John said. 2 Corinthians 2.17, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. But the modern translations say, unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. Yes, they do. That's why they came up with these Bibles, to make a little cheddar cheese, right? Also found in the New King James Version. Let me tell you something. You can just believe it or not. The New King James is not the King James. They're different. I'll show you something. Mark chapter 10, the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and saith unto them, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Is it hard for everybody to enter the kingdom of God? No, I got saved when I was eight. I just believed Jesus died on the cross. Amen? Amen? That's easy, right? Simplicity in Christ. Who is it hard for, according to this verse? Them that trust in riches. So... That was taken out of every modern translation. And it just simply says how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. They took it out. Isaiah 14, 12. How art thou fallen from, from heaven, O Lucifer? Who is Lucifer? Are you sure? Yeah. Even the Satan worshipers know Lucifer, Satan. They worship him as Lucifer. Okay? So, the NIV says morning star. What's the problem with that? Who's the morning star? Revelation 22, Jesus is the bright and morning star. So remember another Jesus? Lucifer has become Jesus in the modern translations. Deuteronomy 23, there shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. We all know what a sodomite is, don't we? Your pastor, I don't know if he told you this, so I'm going to tell on him. He got invited to preach at a church as some people that he knew, that, and they knew him. And he believed that all those people were good Christians. So he just preached his heart out. And he happened to mention during the sermon that sodomites are guilty of sin, and they're going to go to hell. You got in trouble for that, didn't you? He had people in that church... Tell him, how dare you preach that here? What happened? Because all the modern Bible translations took out the word sodomite and they called him a shrine prostitute. So is it any wonder that all the churches now are openly accepting sodomites, even marrying them in their congregations, using them in the children's church? Same thing, 1 Kings 14, 24, male shrine prostitutes. Luke 1, 15, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost even from his room, from, from his mother's womb. The NIV took out most of that. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Now, what's the difference? Are we still alive even when we're in our mother's womb? And if you kill that life, you are a murderer. But see, they, the modern church doesn't like that. Because the modern church gets abortions and they vote for abortion politicians. So let's take that out of the Bible and change it to, he was fooled with the Holy Spirit from birth, but not from the womb. And it makes a difference. So... Which one of these is right? And knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. And this is referring to Joseph. Is that what we believe, that Joseph was not Jesus' father, correct? The NIV says, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. They omitted the phrase firstborn son. 
And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things. Where, that's what the King James says. Joseph and his mother. Who was Jesus' father? No, you're wrong. The NIV says that Joseph was his father. The child's father and mother. Is there a difference? It's 7 o'clock. Can I go home now? I mean, he all's going to come on at some point, right? Jesus answered him saying, It is written that man should not live by bread alone, but by what? How many? Man does not live by bread alone. And it ends the verse right there. They omitted, but by every word of God. They took it out. So did all the modern translations. I'm using the NIV as a reference. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But the NIV, Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God. And they took out, Get thee behind me, Satan. John 6, 47, Verily I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Who do you have to believe on? Not according to the NIV. He who believes has everlasting life. Does it matter? Does it matter who you believe in? Does it matter what you believe? Can you say, well, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe God sent anybody to hell. Does that matter? Yes, it does. So I'm going to show you here in a little bit some Bibles that disagrees with you all. 1 John 4, 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Remember that? So the NIV said, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. What did they take out? Is come in the flesh. So God just told you where the spirit of Antichrist was. It's in the NIV and the New American Standard and the New English Version and the Holman Christian Standard and any other modern translation because they all take out the same verses. Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Two places in your Bible, Matthew 17, 21, Mark 9, 29, both say the exact same thing. And what is this in reference to? There was a man who had spirits. He had devils in him. The disciples could not cast them out. Jesus said, O ye of little faith, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. The two places, two witnesses in the Bible that tells us how to fight the devil and all of his devils by prayer and fasting, they took them out of every modern translation. And I had a guy get mad at me down in southern Missouri at a fundamental Bible-believing church, this guy got mad at me, came at me, said, you're wrong about that King James. And I said, really? So you don't believe in prayer and fasting to get rid of devils? He said, the King James added that. Should have never been in there. I didn't get very far with that guy. <laughs> For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. That verse, Matthew 18, 11, is gone from every modern translation of the Bible. Matthew 23, 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. In the NIV and other translations, the verses number from 13 to 15. So obviously you see a missing 14 and go, what was there? They took it completely out. And I'll show you why in a little bit. Mark 9, 44. Where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Is that important? Do we need that in our Bibles? They took that out. Mark eleven twenty six. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. Well, that, that matches the, the prayer that Jesus gave. Forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. That verse completely missing out of every modern Bible. I had a trouble getting this on the screen. Mark 16, verses 9 through 20. Now... You'll find new translations that have that in there grudgingly. But here's what they do. They put a line after verse 8. They put a line across the page. And they sequester verses 9 through 20. They separate them from the rest of the Bible. And they say the most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. So what they're saying is you have our permission to not believe these verses if you want to. Because we don't believe they were ever in the Bible. But look at what Mark 16, 9 through 20 is. 
It's about his resurrection. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. All of this stuff, ye shall take up serpents and drink any deadly thing. It shall not hurt them. That's what happened to Paul. A serpent lit on his hand. Didn't hurt him. All of these things where he tells us to preach the gospel and signs and wonders shall follow. All of these things. They said they weren't in the Bible. You don't have to believe those. Now, how do we live by most of the words of God? Every word of God. You've heard now that there are some medicines that are coming in the future that can change your DNA. Who in here thinks it's a really good idea to change your DNA? You know, the difference between humans and chimpanzees is only about a 3% difference in the DNA. But look at the difference it makes. Chimpanzees only vote for Biden. <laughs> hey, you're going to know whose side I'm on by the time I get out here tonight. I guarantee you. Look at Acts 8, 37. And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know what this story this is? The Ethiopian eunuch who said, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? This verse has Philip telling him, baptism won't save you. You must believe. You can get baptized and not believe it. Catholic Church does it all the time. That verse is gone out of every modern Bible. 1 John 5, 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now you show me another verse in any Bible that declares what we believe about the Godhead. That they are Father, Son, or Word, and Holy Ghost. They are three separate, and yet they are one and equal with one another. There is not another verse in any Bible that says it as plain as 1 John 5, 7. But they took it out. This is how the NIV took out the word hell. Out of 54 occurrences of the word hell in your King James, the NIV only has it in there 13 times. The rest of them, they replaced it with grave. Wait a minute. That's what the Jehovah's Witness believe, isn't it? The Jehovah's Witness Bible and the NIV practically say the same thing. God's name, Jehovah, is in your King James Bible seven times. Isn't that, doesn't that sound right? Seven times? By the way, you got a video on the number seven. Go home and watch that in first. You'll like that one. Okay? This Bible has God's signature in it. Number patterns. I'm not a mathematician, but I know how to count. Do you know the phrase, Word of God, is in your King James Bible exactly 49 times? That's seven times seven. Wow is right. And there's all kinds of neat stuff like that in that DVD. Go home and watch it tonight. Amen? If I get you home in time. Now, seven times your King James calls him Jehovah. Jehovah, 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 Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. But the new King James also took it out as well. You'll not find the name Jehovah in the new King James Bible. Same with the NIV. What is Sheol? Does anybody know? Sheol. I knew you would knew that. I was hoping you wouldn't say anything. <laughs> they got over that a long time ago here from what I heard. That's just what Ron told me, all right? That's just... Sheol. Now, let's say you got a good dose of the Holy Spirit one night and you decided to go to the tavern here in town. And you were going to warn all those drunkards in there about if they die, they'll go to Sheol. What will they tell you? No, don't say nothing. But if you said, you know, you're a drunkard, and if you die in this condition, you'll go to hell. I bet you most of those guys would say, you know what, you're probably right. Because they know what hell is. And most of those guys in that tavern know they're going. But who knows what Sheol is? So the New King James says, let us swallow them alive like Sheol. But nobody knows what it is. 
New King James, they removed hell 22 times, replaced with either Sheol, the grave, or Hades. And Hades is actually the god of the dead in Greek mythology. So, you want to stick with the NIV, right? So, my question is, which NIV are you going to stick with? The New Testament came out in 1973. The Complete Bible came out in 1978. But then they changed it from 78 to 84 in just, what is that, six years? They changed it, rewrote it, retranslated it. So the 1984 NIV is different than the 1978 NIV. Then they changed it again back in 96. You remember hearing about a gender-neutral Bible where God wasn't going to be a male anymore? Well, they tried that in America. It didn't sell. So they pulled it back off the shelves. They sold it in England. So then they revised, in 1996, they came out with another NIV, supposedly written on a third grade reading level, called the NI uh, revised version. Then the TNIV in 2005, the TNIV was the gender neutral Bible of 1996 that they tried to sell in America, nobody bought it. They changed the name, now everybody's buying it. Then, in 2011, they translated it again. Well, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different changes to the NIV just since 1978. Some of you hadn't changed socks that many times since 1978. Now, why are they different? That's the question I wanted to know. And I already knew the answer. Deuteronomy 32, I want you to turn your Bible there, and then I want you to turn to John 15. We're going to compare. God does a tremendous job in his Bible of always showing you contrast. The first day of creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God called the light good, and the darkness he called night. So we know the difference between light and day, or light and darkness, night and day. We know the difference. There's a contrast there. Things that are light, we are children of the day and not of darkness. The world are children of darkness. We are the sons of God. The world and all the lost people, they are children of Belial, sons of Belial, ye child of the devil. They are like that. So the Bible always gives you contrast. It shows you the bad, then it shows you the good. Deuteronomy 32, verse 32 says, For their vine is the vine of Sodom. Now tell me, what fruit, no pun intended, does the vine of Sodom produce? Sodomites. Sodomy, which God said was an abomination in both testaments of the Bible. He said it's wrong, it's evil, it's wicked. And sodomy really isn't the disease, it's a symptom of the disease. The disease is sin. And sin left unchecked and unhindered by the word of God produces a population of sodomites. And we're surrounded by them. Do they live in Fredericktown? Do they teach in the schools? Do they stand behind pulpits? You better believe they do. You just may not know it, but they do. He said, their fields of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of gall, clusters are bitter. Who's had anything bitter? You ever eaten unripe figs? Or uh, I'm not thinking of figs. I want to think of persimmons. I love persimmons. But I guarantee you, you get one of them things that ain't ripe yet, you'll pucker for a week. Now notice John 15. I am the true vine. What kind of vine? So we have a contrast here. The vine of Sodom is full of lies and it's full of poison. The cruel venom of asps, he said, the poison of dragons, the devil's a dragon. What did Satan do to Eve? He poisoned her. He spoke wrong words to her and caused her to believe it. He shifted her thinking to his way with his poison that comes out of his mouth like a serpent does, right? So the vine of Sodom is full of poison, like the poison Darnell. The vine of Christ is the true vine. It can never be wrong and it can never lie. So he said in verse 4, John 15, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. And that's what, in the parable of the seed and the sower, determines who goes to heaven and who doesn't. The first three groups never produce fruit. 
Either the stony ground causes the vine or the plant to wither, or the thorny ground chokes the word out and it never produces fruit under perfection, the gospel says. The fourth group goes to heaven. So, would you rather have a Bible that came from a true vine or a vine of Sodom? And remember, what the vine of Sodom will produce? Sodomy. So now does it make sense? All these churches abandoning the King James Bible, maybe even First Baptist down here, and why now these same churches are open and accepting of sodomy and sodomites in their congregation. One always produces the other. So let me show you how this works in the Bible issue. There are two primary manuscript lines. Now remember, we established that we don't have any of the originals that were written on by any of the apostles, the prophets, Moses. We don't have any of those original papers. All we have is copies. The Old Testament scribes did a pretty good job of copying. We don't have any errorful manuscripts from the Old Testament. The New Testament is where it gets tricky. Because in the New Testament days, you didn't have scribes. You just had believers in the churches that would take the letter from Paul and copy it. Remember in Colossians, Paul said to the Colossians, take this letter, send it to the church at Laodicea, and the letter I wrote to Laodicea, have it read here in Colossae. So copies had to be made. Okay, So the majority text, the text that the King James Bible, which includes the Textus Receptus, where the King James was translated from, is the basis for the King James Bible. It includes over 5,000 different Greek manuscripts, either partial or complete manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, because the New Testament was written in Greek. And the disagreement in between those 5,000 manuscripts is minuscule. And I mean like 98% of the time, this manuscript from... Laodicea will agree as almost every word with the one that's in Colossae. And there may be a word here that's later on over here in the verse, because in Greek you don't have a word order like we do in English. So you can put the words anywhere. Depends on how they were spelled. So you have all of the manuscripts that agree almost everything that they say, including all of those verses that we saw missing. They're all in the majority text. Then you have two other manuscripts. One's from a monastery in Mount Sinai found in the mid-1800s that date back to A.D. 300 called the, the Sinaiticus document or the Sinaiticus text, Mount Sinai. The other one, guess where it is? In the basement of the Vatican. It's called the Vaticanus. Now, will the Catholics tell you the truth about what God said? Never. So, these two manuscripts, let me put them up on the screen here. These two manuscripts, from where the NIV, the New King James, the New English Version, the Revised Standard Version, the Holman Christian Standard, the New American Standard Bible, and every other modern translation in English and every other language in the world, were primarily translated from these two Greek texts dating from around A.D. 300. Here's the problem. These two Greek texts disagree with each other into the thousands of times. In just the four Gospels, a man by the name of Dean Bergen said that he found over 3,000 differences where one manuscript, the Sinaiticus, didn't say what the Vaticanus said just in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over 3,000 times. Now, if you were on trial for murder and you needed two witnesses to verify where you were, would you be able to use these guys as your witness? No, because they would get on the stand and they wouldn't agree as what they were supposed to say. We're talking about something far more serious than you going up the river for murder. We're talking about whether or not you'll receive everlasting life or go to hell. 
Dean Bergen said it is easier to find two consecutive verses in the which the two manuscripts differ the one from the other than two consecutive verses in which they entirely agree. Of the Codex Sinaiticus, the one found in the Mount Sinai Monastery, the BBC did a documentary about this document, and it basically favored this document. But you know what it said? They said, it is history's most altered manuscript. When you look at it, if you know what you're looking for, and when you look at the Codex Sinaiticus, several people that have looked at it said, it looks like different scribes are having a debate and an argument about what most every verse says. The verse will be written out of Greek, some scribe will cross out a word and then write a Greek word on top of it saying it should say this. So you can't even depend on this one to tell you the truth, much less both of them together. So here's what the verses that I showed you all ago that were missing, they're all missing out of these two manuscripts. So does it make sense now? Okay? Now, most, practically all modern Bibles are translated from a common Greek text. In the mid-1800s, a man by the name of Eberhard Nessel compiled from these two and a few other manuscripts a different Greek text than the one the King James translators used. In 1968, Kurt Alon, who was a German theologian, undertook the work that Eberhard Nessel had started in 1898. And so now, the, the, the Greek New Testament that I got in Bible college was the Nessel Aland Greek text. It's the Greek text followed by practically all modern Bible translations in any language. And as of right now, the Nessel Aland Greek text is in its 28th revision. You know what that means? It has been altered 28 times since 1898. So, when they come out with the 29th edition of the Nessalon Greek text, all of the Bible publishing companies will have to go back, rewrite their Bibles to match the Greek text. So, you have a Bible that changes every 10, 15, 20 years, or you have a Bible that hasn't changed in over 400. Which one do you want? Which one do you trust in? David Parker, the United Bible Society, said this, The text is changing. Every time that I make an addition of the Greek New Testament, or anybody does, we change the wording. We are maybe trying to get back to the oldest possible form, but paradoxically, we're creating a new one. Every translation is different. Every reading is different. And although there's been a tradition in parts of Protestant Christianity to say there is a definitive single form of the text, the fact is you can never find it. There is never, ever a final form of the text. And yet the psalm says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So which one you gonna, which one you gonna buy into? Which one you gonna base your soul's future on? The ever-changing one, where they take out sodomites, and they take out hell, and they take out whatever offends anybody, or the one that may offend you, but it'll save you. Now, I'm going to give you... When does hee-haw come on? You have to understand, I'm crunching down about 10 hours of video down in about... Okay? But I'm having fun doing it. You guys are great to speak to. I appreciate it. I hope nobody tries to beat me up when I leave here tonight. Three things I'm going to teach you and I'm going to let you go. Bible inspiration, Bible preservation, Bible translation. Question number one, was the Bible inspired, inspired by God in the original manuscripts? Yes. Can I believe that the Bible is 100% correct in every subject and every word? Is it biblical or just the emotional connection to a book that has errors? What do scholars and believers acknowledge? Inspiration of the original manuscripts. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's all you need to know. If it's in your Bible, it's right. Don't care how bizarre it sounds. There were giants in the earth in those days. I believe that. I've done, I've done teachings on giants. Giants are fascinating to me. I believe in giants, dragons, and unicorns. You know why? All three of them are in your Bible, King James Bible. Okay? I believe in them. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
if I'm wrong, it's the Bible that corrects me for instruction in righteousness. Second Peter 1.21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now here's how that happened. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. So where did Jeremiah get his words from? He got them from God. He said, Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. That's called inspiration. That's how God did it. With Ezekiel, I'm, I'm not going to read all this, but Ezekiel saw a hand come down from heaven. It had a roll of a book in it. And the hand handed that book to Ezekiel, and he said, Ezekiel, eat that thou seest. And he ate it, and he said, it was in my mouth, sweet as honey. And then God said, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. God transmitted his very words directly into the mind and heart of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel was faithful. He did exactly what God told him to do. Jeremiah did too, and it cost him prison time, didn't it? You remember that old king Jehoiakim who read three or four leaves of what Jeremiah wrote? Took a pen knife, cut them up, threw them in the fire. Remember that? He should have never done that. Because when Jeremiah heard about it, he said, Sons, take out your pen. I'm not only going to rewrite those words that I sent to him, but I'm going to add a whole bunch more to them. Amen? So be careful how you handle the word of God. The inspired words were written. In Exodus, God said, Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. You know that everything I'm telling you, if you were to go home and try to tell somebody the exact words that I just told you tonight, would you be able to do it? No. If I told you... One sentence between here and your house, you'd get it wrong. At least one word, right? When we, you build houses. When you work in construction, do you do handshakes or do you sign contracts? Which is better, Ron? Why? Because men will lie, won't they? You get them in court, men will tell lies, won't they? To save money. But if you have it written down, it's there forever. Now, why didn't God just orally transmit his word? Because he knew we would foul it up. So he wrote it down. Write these words, Ezekiel, Exodus, Isaiah 8, 1. Take thee a great roll and write in it. Isaiah 38, write it before them at a table and note it in a book. I even had one guy say, nowhere in the Bible does it say God wrote a book. Oh, yes, it does. <laughs> so that's a plain teaching on Bible inspiration. God inspired Jeremiah, Paul, John, Matthew, Jude, um, Moses, everything they wrote down in those originals were the word of God. Now, I don't have this in my notes. Turn to Isaiah chapter 40. I'm going to give you something very important. Well, maybe I do have this in my notes. Take a look up here. Turn to Isaiah 40 and look up here. What happens to your Bible after you've read it for the last 60 years? A Bible that's falling apart belongs to a Christian who ain't. Amen? I got the first Bible my mom gave me after I got called to preach. I still have it. It's got pages. It's got coffee stains in it. Chinese food crumbs in it. It's got everything in it. But I'm not letting go of that Bible. My mama gave me a King James and hoped that I would never turn away from it. She knew better. So did my wife. But what happens after a book or a, a roll is written and it's handled thousands of times? What happens over the years if it just lays there? It'll crumble. Now let me show you the difference. Papyrus is where we get the word paper. And what they did was they had this reed that grew in marshy ground like tall grass. And you know how grass grows in layers? Well, they'd take that reed and they'd cut it and they'd split it and they'd weave those layers together and lay it out in the sun and let it dry, and that was what they wrote on. So papyrus is grass. Remember that. Say that with me. Papyrus is grass. Okay? Vellum is animal skin. They would take sheepskin or something real thin, and they would spread it out, they would tan it, lay it out in the sun, dry it, and it became soft so they could write on. The ink would stick to it, and that was called vellum. Now, Here's what God said about that. 
Are you in Isaiah 40? The voice said, cry. Verse 6, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. Now look at this. Vellum is flesh. Papyrus is grass. What happens to both flesh and grass over the years? They rot. They corrupt. So, if we were to say, I believe God inspired the words of the Bible in the original manuscripts, that would be a good saying, but if you stop there, and most ministries do, they don't believe that God preserved every word. They only believe God inspired the original manuscripts. But what happened to the originals? They did this. All flesh is grass. Verse 7, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand for how long? So do you think God knew that once they wrote it on vellum or papyrus that those would decay? Do you think God had a plan then to preserve those words past the originals? And he said it in Isaiah 40. That's what he was going to do. I don't care how many times you write it on vellum or paper or in your Bible. It's going to fade away. But I promise you, you will always have every word that I said. That's what God said. Out of 66 books from 40 authors, not a single original manuscript survives. If the word of God is only in the original manuscripts, then Isaiah 40 cannot be true. Cannot be true. Here's what Dallas Theological Seminary said. We believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, which means we understand the whole Bible is inspired in the sense that holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the very words of scripture. We believe that this divine inspiration extends equally uh, and fully to all parts of the writings, historical, poetical, doctrinal, and prophetical, as appeared in the original manuscripts. And they said, we believe that the originals, therefore, is without error. But they stop right there. They told me that the Greek text, the Hebrew text, and the translations all had lies in it. And I believed it. So, were the inspired words preserved? Did God, past the original manuscripts, preserve every single word? Thank you for that. First Peter, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The word of the Lord endureth forever. Deuteronomy 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Everything that God told Moses, we still have them to this very day. Psalm 12. You know what Psalm 12 is? This is in that DVD you're going to go home and watch. What is, have you ever heard the phrase 70 times 7? Is that in your Bible? What's that number when you multiply 70 times 7? 490, right? Do you know Psalm 12 is the 490th chapter of the Bible? And it says, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Wow. You mean... God oversaw even the layout of our Bible. I believe everything that God does is in order. Let all things be done how? Decently and in order. Does the sun not come up same time every day? Does the seasons not come same time every year? Amen? Isaiah 30 verse 8. Oh, by the way, verse 7, thou shalt keep them. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God said that. I was told that God didn't do that. Not in so many words. Oh, no, it's very subtle. There's an error in this manuscript. Here's a textual variant from this manuscript to this manuscript. This actually is a poor translation. A better translation is. That's what I heard for three years. I dropped out two Bible colleges, by the way. I don't have a degree. Isaiah 30, verse 8. Now go write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. 
Did God preserve every word? Psalm 19, 9, the fear of the Lord is in clean, enduring forever. Psalm 33, 11, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Psalm 93, 5, thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Psalm 117, 2, for his merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. What did Jesus say? That man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. First Peter, man being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. First Peter 1 25, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And if you don't have the word of God, you can't preach the gospel. Faith cometh by and hearing by and if you don't have the Word of God, you cannot have faith. Faith in you did not originate in you. It originated from God's Word to you. And that's where you believed it. Second John 1, 2, For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever, John said. Was John lying? So, we believe in Bible inspiration, that God inspired the very words, we believe in Bible preservation, that God preserved every Hebrew word and every Greek word, every Aramaic word, because part of the Old Testament was written in Aramaic, which is like a first cousin to, to Hebrew. So we have three languages the Bible is written in, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Who speaks any of those languages here? Anybody speak Greek? Anybody read Hebrew? Can you even... Even, can you recognize the letters? If I gave you a Hebrew verse and told you, if you don't, if you don't read this, I'm going to kill you, you'd just have to say, blow me away. So how can, how can the common man, not the pulpit guy, the people in the pew, how can they ever believe the word of God if it wasn't translated? Do y'all down here believe in the second amendment? I, I didn't say practice it tonight on me. <laughs> you believe in it? You don't think they ought to change that, do you? Because what does the Second Amendment do? It guarantees the right of the American people to defend not only their life and their property and their family and their possessions, but also according to the intention of the Second Amendment, guarantee their liberties. The Second Amendment protects the entire rest of the Constitution, doesn't it? As long as we, the people, have a right to keep and bear arms. And by the way, the Constitution didn't give us the right to keep and bear arms. It didn't say that. It said the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed because the founders recognized that God gave us the right to keep and bear arms. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, the Philistines under Saul's reign, Saul reigned over Israel, the Philistines had so much control over Israel. Sounds like China's control in this country? Stealing our election? Our guns are next. You believe that? Your Bible's next. So the Philistines wouldn't allow any Jew to have a blacksmith shop for the specific reason that they didn't want the Jews making swords and spears and knives and weapons. Because Philistines said, if a war breaks out, we're going to have the advantage because we have the weapons and the Israelites don't. Only Saul and Jonathan could carry a sword. You know what that is? Only the government carries the sword. You will be left defenseless. What do you think could happen in this country in a year? You think we might need those guns? I hope to never use one. But I got plenty. And I just bought 500 rounds from Reg Kelly. Okay? I hope to never fire my gun ever. But to defend my country and my church and my wife and my family, if I have to, I will. So is it fair then that only the pulpit guy has the real word of God, but you people in the pews never have it?
Is that fair? Arm yourselves, people. Amen. I believe that. I believe that because I know this man. Did God translate the Bible? And I know some pastors that would differ from me on this. They would say, well, I use a King James. We only use a King James. But I don't believe a translation can be inspired by God. I found out different. I'll tell you how. Daniel said, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. That's what the angel said to Daniel. Are the scriptures still holy? Are they still true? Remember when Paul said all scripture is given by inspiration of God? Is is one of those words I learned in third grade English. Present tense. Does the Holy Ghost still move in you when you read the Bible? Then it's still inspired, isn't it? Amen. So there is... Job 32, 8 says, There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. If the script, if it's scripture, it's inspired. Rule number one. Um, Isaiah 28. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. God, in Isaiah 28, he's berating the prophets and the priests for being drunkards. If Ron came in Sunday, drunk as a skunk, got up here, slobbering all over the pulpit, slurring all his words, and then puking on the communion table. Would y'all put up with that? Have you already? <laughs> I'm just checking. Because I know a little bit about his past, okay? You wouldn't put up that, would you? And that's what God's doing in Isaiah 28. He's talking about the prophets and the priests. He said they've erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. And he said all tables are full of vomit. The only thing worse than a preacher serving up vomit on Sunday is the dogs in the pew who lap it up. There would be no false prophets if there wasn't a bunch of phony Christians around. Amen? Whom shall he teach knowledge? God is looking for people that he can teach, not people who think they know it all. Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's what I've tried to show you tonight, that the Bible and its doctrine is not all on one page, not all in one paragraph. You have to search the scriptures like the Bereans to see whether these things be true or not. Amen? The worst thing that you can do, if you don't agree with something I said tonight, the worst thing you could do is go on the Internet to see if the answer is true or not. The Internet's going to lie to you every time. I'm on the Internet. I know the Internet will lie to you, okay? But God's Word will never lie to you. So if you don't agree with something I said, go ask God. Do what I did. He'll tell you. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. So think about it. What was Moses' problem? Why didn't he want to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go? You shook your head. Why? He had stammering lips, didn't he? So the Old Testament, Moses always represents the Old Testament. Moses stammered. So with stammering lips, God spoke to his people, didn't he? Through Moses. And the Israelites don't understand the Old Testament, do they? Because Moses stammered. That's why he stammered. God made it so that they couldn't understand it. Even to the day, this day, the Bible says there's a veil over every Jew who reads the Old Testament. They cannot see it for what it is. They don't see Christ anywhere in the Old Testament. We do because we have here a little and there a little. We have it in the New Testament, don't we? So he said with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. So God spoke in the Old Testament through Moses with stammering lips. God noticed now the Old Testament written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Why is it the New Testament written in Hebrew? John was a Jew. Paul was a Jew. Uh, Peter was a Jew. All the New Testament writers were all Jews, but why didn't they write the New Testament in Hebrew? Because God said, in another tongue will I speak to this people. See, notice in the New Testament, he not only changed the mediator of the law from Moses to Jesus, he changed the law from the law of works to the law of grace. And with the change, Paul said, with the change in law, there had to be a change of the mediator. And there was a change in the language. Why? Because God knew that when Jesus came, the Jews would reject his gospel. So did God have a different plan after that? He said, yeah, I'll go to the Gentiles. They'll believe me. 
The only problem is the Gentiles don't speak Hebrew. What languages do the Gentiles speak? Well, look at Acts chapter 7. In verse 8, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea, Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and parts of Libya and about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, 17 languages here. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. God not only changed the law, he not only changed the mediator, he changed the language. From an unreadable dead Hebrew language to the language that everybody speaks. And you and I, I pray in English. And when I hear God, he's speaking English to me. When I talk to God, I'm talking English. When I talk to somebody about God, I'm talking English. So did God translate our Bible correctly? Well, he said in Isaiah 28, for a stammering lips in another tongue. Turn to 1 Corinthians 14, and I'm going to let you go home. This is my fourth sermon to preach today, and I'm a little tired. And your pastor's just sitting there doing nothing. And I bet you're going to pay him too, aren't you? No, I love this man. I really do. 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 is about the subject of unknown tongues. Now, what did they do on the day of Pentecost? Were they speaking? Was it gibberish? It was languages that the Gentiles all knew, wasn't it? See, God is a God of knowledge, knowledge and understanding. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times, he said in Isaiah. So God wants us to know his word. So here's, what, here's how Paul rewrote Isaiah 28, 11. He said in verse 21 of 1 Corinthians 14, In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. So does God speak Greek? Yes. Did God write the Bible and give it to us in English? Yes, I believe he did. And I'll show you this. And I'm going to let you go. Notice this. There was a rule for speaking in tongues in the church, wasn't there? So let's say that the Holy Ghost came on Brother Doyle and he stood up and he spoke in Parthian. And the brother behind him came up as a second witness. After him spoke the same thing in a different language. Maybe a third person in the congregation would stand up and speak in an unknown tongue. But according to the Holy Spirit, they were then to sit down. And one was to stand up and translate so that everybody would know what they just said. Did I? If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most three. Not everybody all willy-nilly all at once. Amen to that. I've been to that church. And that by course, and let one interpret, which means translate. So watch this. Does God have to follow his own rules? Sure he does. God's not a man that he should lie. He don't break his own rules. Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. In course, in order, those are the three unknown languages of the original Bible. And God said, let one translate it. There is one Bible in English that tells you every word of God. And I believe it's this one right here. In fact, I believe it so much, I've based my soul's future on it. I'm willing to die for my country, and I'm willing to die for my Bible. Don't ask me to live down here without my Bible, because I tried it once. It didn't work out so good. And I'm telling you, see, I've been down that road. Now I'm standing at the entrance to that road, and I'm trying to warn everybody, don't go down there. Why not? I've been down there. What's down there you won't like. If God lets you come back like he did me, you'll be glad. And you'll know that I warned you about the right thing. But I'm telling you, don't go down that road. There's some people who sat in church for 60, 70 years and said, all I've ever had is King James, and that's all I'll ever have is the King James. 
God bless you people. God didn't let me do that. He let me wander. He let me go astray. So that I, but he let me come back. And I'm telling you with everything that's in me, hold on to that book and don't ever let it go.